He is the 2012 PA Angler of the Year, a Bassmaster Elite Series Pro, and he just happens to run the largest independent bass boat company in business, Mr. Phoenix Boats, Gary Klaus, this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Hey, it must be Wednesday because uh, we're back in your life. Welcome to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Putting a little hump back in your hump day. And um, thank you for tuning in. Hopefully we can distract you from some of the craziness of the world with... um, some stuff that really doesn't matter, but matters to us, and that's fishing chat. And this week, I got a cool show. But before we go into this week's show, you guys are the freaking best. Every single one of you that listens to this show, every single like, every single comment, all of that basically massages the YouTube algorithm and uh, continues this channel to grow. Um, just a few shows ago, I was ex- celebrating the fact that you know, we got 100,000 subscribers. We're at like 130,000 subscribers just a few weeks later. Um, Thank you. You guys are incredible. Um, Continue to spread the word about this little show, and we'll continue to make sure that there is a show uh, for you guys to watch and all sorts of content. We post stuff basically every single day on YouTube. So if you're not a YouTube subscriber, get over there and subscribe. If you're listening to this on a streaming service, make sure you give us a rating there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, that's all we ask. I, I don't ask you to to buy things and all sorts of that. We just ask to drop a like. I mean, if you like anything, not just this content, but anything social media-wise, that's how an algorithm works. I mean, basically... It's it's like a crowd clapping. If 10% of the crowd claps, more people will clap. If 20%, 30%, it will grow. So the more likes you give any of these videos or any videos you enjoy on any streaming service, the better it is for us. So thank you very much for that. I digress. We will move forward. This week's show is a fun one because I have uh, an Elite Series angler on here, but an Elite Series angler with an asterisk because he's not just an Elite Series competitor. He runs the most, in my opinion, I, I don't think there's another, but the most successful independently owned bass boat company in the United States, in the world. Um, and uh, also the boat that I choose to run, and that is a Phoenix boat. And I think you guys will see one of the major reasons. I mean, Phoenix boats are an amazing product and what amazes me about them is they get better and better as the years go on. Like, you know, where I was used to in the past, uh, a lot of boat companies would, you know, oh, wow, they're not using the metal, you know, plugs anymore. And, you know, they've switched to plastic or whatever. It seems like every year my boat shows up and it's even better than it was the previous year with, innov- you know, innovations, heated seats. I mean, there's an innovation you didn't know you needed in the bass boat and world, but I am freaking thankful for because it is incredible it it, all that coldness in your core takes that away um but they just keep getting better and it's because of the drive from the ownership they they really founded phoenix boats on one way they said man we've worked with a lot of boat companies we know how to run a successful boat company but what happens is people buy it and they start pulling parts away to make more profit on it let's just make a really good boat and that's exactly what phoenix boats are um and enough of this i know somebody's gonna say well of course it's a commercial he's sponsored but well yes it's but it's not a commercial i'm telling you what i feel and um riding a phoenix boat i mean literally here's the best way when people come up to me at events and ask me you know which is the best boat i'm like go ask the camera boat guys tell them to give you a list of three boats that they run in Phoenix is always at the top of the list. They ride in everybody's boat in the worst conditions, um, and and they'll tell you. But uh, enough about that. Um, The amazing thing about Gary Klaus is not only has he qualified for the Elite Series, not only is he on the Elite Series, but what he is able to juggle and balance is amazing. And in a world full of, you know, go through social media, you see people saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. 
he does things that he shouldn't be able to do and and are things that people would say you can't do this you can't you know you can't run a successful boat company and fish your leech you can't one or the other you're gonna pull it both well this week we get inside the head of the one and only gary klaus and without further ado let's bring him in right now from his shop in winchester tennessee this is one i've been looking forward to because uh this you're a person that amazes me Gary Klaus, I mean, but the things, the things that you do in your life, I mean, I leave an elite series event that I don't even compete in. I don't show up for pre-fish. I just talk into a microphone at the end of the week. I leave there and I'm exhausted and I'm like, I need recovery. And I think about people like yourself that literally go and run a boat company outside of your elite series career. And now I'm I'm seeing inside your shop and I think you're just even more cooler every time I, every time I talk to you, but how do you do that? Or, you know, like, do you ever stop to think like, wow, I've got a bunch of dream jobs that have become a nightmare? No, um, I, I actually, um, I feel so fortunate and so blessed in so many ways and humble, you know, to, to, you know, it hadn't always been like this. I went through a lot of ups and downs in my career and, um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm feel so fortunate to be where I'm at and to be doing what I'm doing. That um, sometimes I I walk through the plant or I'll I'll, I'll be heading to a tournament. And I just almost pinch myself like, wow, is this um, you know is this real? You know, it's just that I, I'm just I'm just so amazingly blessed. You don't even know, you know. So when did it all start for you? Like, at what what was the youngest age you remember being like, man, I I need to was it boats first or was it fishing first or what it was, drove it? It was fishing. Um, I, I grew up on a dairy farm in South Missouri. And um, um, like most farm kids in those days, when you get big enough to work, you just work. You go, go with your dad and you drag a bale of hay or you feed a calf or you do whatever it is. You know, and you start driving tractors when you're big enough to get to the pedals and see, over the, see how, how to drive. You know, I mean, I was hauling hay, raking hay, baling hay. 10, 11, 12 years old, you know, and um, started fishing up in, a, in the uh, the ponds, the farm ponds uh, that we had on, on the farm. And um, I remember I, I bought a, a Bassmaster magazine, 1975 edition. In those days, they had a magazine that um, they sold one on the newsstand per year. And then if you wanted the other six, um, Every, every two months you get a, you had to join bass. So I had the magazine, I was reading about farm ponds and there was one article that said, written by somebody about how to fish farm ponds, you know? And so I bought this magazine to learn more about how to catch bass in, in a farm pond. And then I filled out the little card and sent it in and, and joined bass and started reading about tournaments and the pro fishermen of, in those days. And uh, that's, that's really where I got hooked. Um, some, some friends in the family started taking me fishing uh, to Toledo Bend back when, in the in the, the late seventies when Toledo Bend was was was, was about like it was the best there was in those days. Uh, yeah. So that's 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 what got me hooked. Well, what do you remember? You know, like it was it for me anyways, and and I find this one of the unique things that everybody in this business, no matter what they do, I mean, I remember just. For me, I remember thinking like, I don't know how I'm going to make a living, but I need to like, I honestly didn't think about making a living fishing until it got to the point where you were like, people were like, what are you going to do when you're older? And then I was like, wait a second, I need to find some excuse so that they don't pull me away from the water and, and that I can actually, do, do you remember the exact moment where you said, I, I need to make this as a living or did, did one thing just lead to another and you ended up in this industry? Well, you know, you know, when I in high school, I had I had two passions: um, bass fishing and, and cars. Well, I had three passions, but we'll talk about two of them. But but uh, <laughs> bass, fishing, bass fishing and cars. And so my 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 path. Uh, my dad would have loved it if I would, would have went down the path of being a farmer. He was a dairy farmer um, um, until I was nine, and had had a farm with milk Holstein cows a hundred head a day and worked his butt off 
you know, this, um, that, that's a, that's a job. Now you talk about a job that's full time. That is a job. And he sold the big farm as, as I called it in, in 69 and bought a smaller farm, had a couple hundred acres and had beef cattle in those days. And that's when I was in high school <clears throat> and, and, and I <clears throat> to realize I didn't want to be a farmer for too much work actually. <laughs> but, uh, in, in high school, I went to an auto mechanics class because I loved I loved cars. I, I got to where I was pretty good with mechanical things. I loved cars, and I, I went to an auto mechanics class for two years in high school. So, like from uh, from from noon till about three thirty, they bust us over to a big to a bigger town. We were a real small town where I grew up in Mansfield, Missouri, and Mountain Grove had a, a, a auto mechanics program. So I went over there for about three hours a day for two years. And you went through the program and you come out, I mean, you come out really a mechanic, you know, because there's a, there's a lot of time spent. And I get back to, they bust us back to the, to the, the hometown about 3.30 and went to basketball practice then. So it was cars and basketball and fishing was my whole high school. Uh, uh, but So I, I get out of high school and I was fishing tournaments uh, at the BFL level by that time, yeah. basketball at the BFL, stuff like that. I got out of high school on a Friday and then went to work on, at a Chevrolet dealership on Monday morning. That was just, there was really no, um, there was no thought of college for me. It wasn't, um, wasn't that I didn't want to go, but I just, I, I wanted, I wanted to work and fish. That was my two things. And so I, I was auto mechanic, uh, for about four years, five years probably. And I had bought a boat from a dealership in Branson, Missouri. And um, ended up going to work for him, rigging boats. Um, you know, in those days, the dealer um, bought the boat. Pretty much, it had seats and a gas tank. That's about it. And the dealer bought the motor and the gauges, trolling motor, electronics. Bought all yeah. that stuff and put it together. And that's what I did. Since I, my mechanical background and fishing and working on old boats as I grew up to this point, so. That, that's how I really got in the boat, went to work for a dealer in, in, in Branson, Missouri. And, uh, so that's, that, that's when I, you know, and I know by that time I'm kind of, I'm becoming to want to be a pro fisherman. So I stepped out there in, uh, starting in about 84, um, I was 24 years old and, uh, I had had some success at the local and regional levels and decided I'm going to try my hand at the big leagues and, so I started fishing in those days the Bassmaster Invitationals, and I started traveling with uh, Charlie Campbell, was was from Springfield, wow. and uh, Stacy King was had become a friend of mine from from, from fishing local tournaments. Uh, a guy named Howard McAllister, who is a great friend of mine today, and actually a Phoenix dealer in Branson, Missouri now. One of our one of our has done a great job there for us, and uh, and a guy named Chet Dalton, if you remember that. Name. Oh yeah, years ago, Chet was. Chip. We all traveled together, <clears throat> and Charlie was Charlie was a was a basketball coach from Forsyth, Missouri. So he was. We were like his little team, you know. Come on, boys, let's go. Get out of bed and let's go. And he he herded us around and kind of kind of kept us um, probably kept us out of trouble. To be quite honestly, but and wasn't Chet? Didn't Chet like? Didn't he get drafted by the Miami Dolphins or play for them at one point? He, he did. He, he yeah. Got, he played college ball and uh, got drafted. Actually, was drafted the, the year, uh, whatever year it was that that the Dolphins went undefeated. Oh wow! He was drafted that year, and actually, he told me some stories about. It. They're really really interesting. You ought to have him on sometime. Yeah, he had some stories about. Uh, he went through uh, training camp, and they did the forty yard. <clears throat> he was the fastest guy on the team until so Mercury Morris ran, and he said Mercury Morris went off the line and stumbled to one knee and still beat his time. So. <laughs> He said, I thought I was fast until I got up against him. But, uh, no, those were the great days, you know, when I did that for about four years. Um, the last term that I fished was upstate New York. And uh, I had uh, – by that time I was um, – I had – was fishing a lot, and I was coming to Nashville, and I went – was working for, for Stratus boats in the summertime. Okay. Rigging boats at the dealer meeting, and I went to upstate New York in the fall. It's when the tournaments, th those days, the, the season started in the fall. Yeah. Went upstate New York and took my expense money 
that they give me for staying in Nashville for a month or two. And I decided I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to finish this tournament. I'm going to win lots of money back and pay my credit card bill off. And, <laughs> and, and I didn't. And I, so <laughs> I went broke, I, to be quite honest, fishing. And that was my first round of professional fishing. Went broke and ended up going to work for Stratus Boats. And that, was, that started my path down the, the, the boat career. So how did you, I mean, I know a lot of incredible riggers and boat mechanics, but how did you go from the back of the boat rigging to literally at one point running Stratos boats? And, and, and obviously we'll get into Phoenix after that, but that's, that's a big step. That's not a little step. No, well, you know, I started rigging boats just because of my mechanical ability and, um, then I went to work full time at Stratus, working in the plant. Then I worked my way into customer service. I guess the way I just, I just stuck with it, you know, I worked in customer service five years and in sales five years. And, um, I learned and, and somewhere along the way, I guess I probably realized, um, you know, so from starting at Stratus to, to Phoenix was a period of about, uh, let's see, that would have been, I gotta stop and think, uh, 80, 80, eight about 25 years, you know, 20 years. Yeah. So 20 years of on the job training, I guess is, is, you know, and, um, I've always had a uh, philosophy of just outwork everybody else. It really is, is what you, is my, been my, my, I guess my motto really is just work, work, work hard and, and it'll happen. You know? Where'd that come from? Did that come from growing up on a farm? My dad. You don't really have an option if you're if you're a farmer. I never worked as hard as he did, but he he literally worked himself to death, literally, and he just he worked and worked and worked and and um, um, I I, you know, as growing up on the farm, I'm I was like every other teenager. I'd I'd avoid work if I could sometimes. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, that's where I got my work ethic from was my dad, without question, and and my mother as well. I mean, she 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 worked to to till almost the day she died doing something, you know, she done, done a lot of things to, she was kind of a hustler of, of a woman for, uh, in, in that era, you know, and done a lot of different things to make money. And, I think that's the thing that nobody talks about. I mean, I talk to my kids about it a lot, but I'm like the, the most important thing in any line of work, doesn't matter what you want to do is that you're willing to outwork anybody like you're, I mean, there's, Everybody sees, just turn on the news. You'll see tons of talent that gets wasted. People talk about talent, but the talent gets you so far. But if you're willing to work harder than anybody else, it, it just seems to work out. Um, in, in my opinion, it's, and it's the only thing you can count on because talent, it, you know, if you look at a sport, you start with talent, talent fades, work ethic stays, you know, and it keeps that talent around a lot longer. Yeah, that's, um, uh... You know the, the two things I think that that passion, yeah. And I, I, I a lot of times I ask young people that I meet, you know, they talk about what they're gonna do, and you know, I ask them what their passion is, because I feel like that if you um, if you follow your passion, you will work harder at that, yeah. whatever that may be. And um, you know, my passion was. Um, you know, in, in 1982, three and four, being a professional bass fisherman was probably one of the dumbest ideas that you could, for, for a <laughs> career, probably one of the dumbest ideas you could have. Now, in today's world, that's quite different. But in those days, it was like, you're going to what? You know, no one really knew, you know, there was a select group of people or a, not a select, but there's a few people that knew what it meant, you know, and that there was a possibility of that. But there wasn't many people making a living at it, you know. It was, that probably wasn't over... I don't know, truly in those days, probably I maybe 30 or 40 guys total making a decent living at it. Yeah. So, if that, yeah. Um, do you, you think know. it's harder now or harder? Like I look at, because you hear all of the chat now and everybody, you know, says they're being outpriced in the sport and all these different things, but I'm like, it's expensive. It's more expensive than it's ever been, but so is everything on earth. Like literally whether it be a, milk or a boat everything is more expensive than it's ever been 
But on top of that, there are so many more opportunities. I mean, you had to explain to people what your dream was. And now there's, you know, collegiate fishing, high school. Do you think it was tougher then or tougher now? You know, that's hard. Um, I, my opinion, it was tougher then. Yeah. There's so many things. Technology has the information on how to catch a fish. Yeah. In those days, the guy, they, those guys wouldn't even tell you what color worm to throw. <laughs> you know, information was so secretive. Nobody, nobody would help you. You know, one of the few people that actually was, was, um, open with me and, and tried to help me besides the guys I traveled with, but Guido Hibson was one that, you know, he, uh, I grew up in South Missouri. He was from middle Lake of the Ozarks area. And he was one of the few, for whatever reason, um, I drew him out in a U.S. bass tournament. Um, early on and we just got along and we'd be traveling wherever we would be. He would always make a point to, to give me a little tip or something and encourage me. Um, and Stella was on the dock when we'd idle out every time we idled out, she would good luck, Gary, you know, and, um, but, uh, you, you know, honestly, I, I think it was, was, it's not to say that it's easy now. No. Um, but there's so many more. There's so much more money, so many, much, there's more opportunity. And, and for the kids that's out there wanting to make a living fishing, it doesn't have to be fishing necessarily that makes yeah. it. You may head that way like I did. And, um, but it may lead you some other direction. Perhaps you, um, Ronnie Moore, there's all kinds of uh, yeah. examples, you know, uh, um, you know, our, uh, I think sometimes, and I was asked this the other day, um, uh, did a, a Louie and I were talking, Louie Stout and I were talking and it was talking about the, the, the New York trip that I went broke on, you know, if I had done better in that tournament, I might not be where I'm at today. So if you, you know, if you stop, yeah. about, you know, cause you know, bass fishing is like a drug. You get a little, you get a little hit of, of winning, you know, and, um, so if I had a, if I'd have done very well in that term or won enough money to keep myself going, you know, you, I don't know. It might've altered, it was altered my path. I'm sure, you know? Yeah. It, uh, that's one of the coolest and most amazing things about life. And if somebody said it to you at the time, like if I ran into you at a truck stop when you're broke and I'm like, don't worry, it'll all work out for at that time. You're just like, please shut up. I'm crushed about what happened, but. It's true. Some of the weirdest things in life that when people look back, they're like that I thought was so bad turned out to be the reason that I ended up here and there. Before we move on, though, I want to talk about the Hibdens because it amazes me. And and, and I got to meet Guido a couple of times. I didn't get to spend a ton of time with him. I've spent some time with Dion. They're a great family. But the amazing thing to me is. You know, Hebden, you don't hear about a lot anymore in record books and stuff like that. You know, he's one of the names that, like, if you dig deep into it, but I'm talking about with younger guys, but I will tell you, you don't talk to, I mean, on this podcast, I can't count the number of anglers that out of nowhere, yep. when you say, hey, man, the guy that really helped me was, it's Guido Hebden, it's that family, it's, it's, and it almost feels like, like, weirdly enough to me, from the outside, it feels like, the Hibdens had this special relationship with Gary Klaus, but they also had that special relationship with Jay Ellis with so many, like there's so many names that just come up and that, that have brought up how amazing Guido Hibden is like, like how he reached out and helped them. It, I mean, he had to be one of the most amazing families in the history of our sport that probably gets credit, but doesn't at the same time, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I do know what you mean. Um, you know, I, it, it, it occurs to me when you're, when we're, when we're talking, I do a blog and I've done a couple of them, one of them on the influence of Rick Clun on, on my life. And he didn't even know it really, you know, at the time. Yeah. And, um, um, uh, the influence of Ray Scott on our whole, uh, but I, I'm thinking now I need to do one on, on Guido's influence on me, you know, um, because there's, there's people in your life that have an influence on you sometimes and, 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 um, you don't even know it. And, um, but yeah, that, they was, they were, <clears throat> they were a great family. And I remember Dion when he was a little kid, 
he, he, he did a little mold. Uh, he, he take, he took a crawfish and put it in a plaster of Paris mold and poured, they poured open mold, some, some, some uh, little crawfish and Gita would put them on the back of his jig, you know, and thread some rubber through them, through the, uh, pinchers. And, uh, matter of fact, he flipped that, that crawl all day when I was with him, he was fishing table rock. He won the tournament actually. I, I drew him out on day one, I think. And, um, but, uh, an amazing family, an amazing man, and and an amazing innovator in our sport. Like if you look back at all the things, like there's so many things that they did uh, in their time that that is uh, it's weird. It's certain things fall through cracks, you know what I mean. But I think it's all you know cyclical. Like I know Dion's son's fishing now, and then all of a sudden, the more he accomplishes, the more people look back and talk about what what Guido and, and that entire family did. It's um, it's amazing, but that's there's so many of those kinds of people in the industry, and and I and I don't think it stands out to people today because I think, like you said, nobody shared stuff back then. Like now, you're so used to seeing not just what the anglers using, but how they're shaking their bait, how long they're leaving it sitting there. You see everything, but back then, it, it was literally like I don't think it was easy on the rookies at all, was it? No. It was not easy on the rock. I can tell you that it was, it was brutal, you know, and you draw, you drew for your partner and argue about whose boat you're going to take. And, and, uh, that must've been a, a mess though. I could only imagine, like if we did that today, I could only imagine the arguments that would happen. It would be fist fight today. But <laughs> I remember I, the, the one of the, the first tournament I fished, the first bass master I fished was on Lake of the Ozarks. And of course, Guido won the tournament, like he won most of them up there. <laughs> um, but I drew out a guy named Randy Berenger. I think it was an 82, probably the first time up, 82 or three. Randy Berenger was a, yeah, a, like, you remember, if you remember that name, he was yeah. a Texas guy from, uh, maybe it was from Waco, Texas. I think he played football down there somewhere and a big old guy. And he, he was really, I, I mean, I'll never, I'll never forget when I know exactly where we went and, uh, I didn't know what flipping was and I had a, and I, we, we, he had like, I caught like 15 pounds, you know, behind him and he had like 17 and we ran way up like the Ozarks and I'm, I can take you right where we fish today, you know, never, never will forget it. He, he was, he was very gracious and, and very helpful to a kid and I'll, I'll never forget that. Did, did you have any that weren't so gracious? I mean, you don't have to give the names out. I know uh, you're a gentleman. <clears throat> You know, I, I can't, I can't, re honestly, I can't remember of ones that weren't, honestly, that they probably have uh, probably forgotten about them. I remember I drew Paul Elias in upstate New York one time and we, we got along great. And, you know, of course, when I drew those kind of guys, I went with them. You know, they were, you know, I'm not going to ask Paul Elias to ride with me across Lake Ontario. And, uh, but I, I do remember we was heading out, we were heading to Shamo Bay and we come out of, uh, out of the river and headed, head, headed a little bit south like you do. And he lined up on the Duck Islands instead of, instead of Stony Point. <laughs> we ran <laughs> to the Duck Islands to get to Shamo Bay. In, in those days, that was a long, you didn't have a GPS. You just had to use a, you know, we used a compass and a paper chart, you know. And that That's the thing too, you know, like how are anglers able to do things? Well, they can also, like you look at how long it took to figure out stuff before and how, like I think of how far off people have been, you know, like, like I remember on a year when we'd run out there and you'd line things up. And, and now that I have a GPS and everything's lined up, I'm like half the time we were even near what we thought, we, you know, you know what I mean? You thought you were on it. Um, or at least I, I know that I'm sure there were some guys that were a lot better, but I, I can get it wrong with the GPS. So sure. I got it wrong back then. It, it's, it's, it's wild. Okay. So talk to me about the transition from Stratos. I mean, you worked with Stratos, you worked your way up, ended up, were you president of Stratos boats at one time? Yes, I was. I, I, I worked, worked at Stratos for about, mm, I guess, 10 or 11 years. And uh, then I went to Triton for six and I came back as president of Stratos. And, um, uh, that, but that was when uh, Jen Mar owned Stratus. That's when I came back as president, and um, and uh, so you know they would I, I, somewhere along the, that time I realized that 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 
I would get my opportunity. I, I really, I, I knew there'd be a window of opportunity. And about 2006, there was a window of opportunity. And I had been thinking about, and I didn't, I didn't have any money to start a boat company. And um, I had mentioned a, a little bit about where Stratus was going as a brand and, and didn't want to really go that direction. And I mentioned it to a friend of mine and he said, well, why don't you just start your own company? I said, I don't, I don't have the money to do that. Said, well, I can't do that. And he said, well, I, I know some people you need to talk to. So I talked to some people and, and, and got a plan together. And I had met Teresa Johnson. Uh, I had hired her to be the HR director when I came back to Stratus in, in, uh, in 2000. That was after the OMC bankruptcy. And Jen Marr bought Stratus out of bankruptcy. And, um, so I was hired to put that company back together and we did, we did a good job of it. And I hired Teresa and then she, she, she'd become like my sister and, um, and Greg Strom, um, who is our boat designer today. When I was working at the dealership that I told you about in Branson behind the dealership, about a hundred yards, 50 yards actually was, a was a fiberglass shop and a guy named Virgil Strom had moved there from Kansas. Okay. Uh, he had a boat company in Kansas called Strom Boats, S T R A A H M, Strom Boats in Kansas. And he had sold that company and moved, kind of retired and moved to Branson. And his son had just come back from the Air Force and went to work for him in this fiberglass shop. Well, that's Greg Strom, who's with me today. So Greg came to Stratus about the same time I did in, in the in the eighties, moved to Nashville about the same time I did. So he's been everywhere I've been to this day, and he's our He's our designer today, and, and I'm telling you, he's the best in the business. He, he knows more about the bottom of the boat than, than anybody alive today, in my, my opinion. So how did you take – I mean, what you guys have accomplished with Phoenix is amazing. You, you know, if you look at all the small independent boat companies that come and, and either stay small for ever or, or never, ever make it, you know what I mean? And what you guys have done, I mean, I would assume the largest independent bass boat manufacturer in the U S right now. I've never thought about that, but it might be, I, I, I don't know. Um, but, but I, I, the, the, and we, I've talked about this a lot or, or internally and thought about it a lot. Um, it's the, well, we talked about two words, passion and, and hard work, a passion and work ethic. And then and the other word that we've talked about a lot in the last three or four years around here is believe. Yeah. So there was people that believed in me along the way. And, um, when somebody believes in you, it's a powerful thing. You know, I remember in, when I was the, my mother always believed in me. Um, and, and I take that for granted, but that's, for everybody, that's not always the case, but my mother did. And I remember in the, I was a <clears throat> sophomore in high school, actually freshman in high school, and I got cut from the basketball team because I was short and I wasn't any good. I mean, <laughs> you know, I really, really was. And uh, over my sophomore year, I went to a different school my sophomore year and came back to Mansfield High School my, my, uh, my junior year, and I had grown a lot and, and I'd gotten a lot better. And I remember being in PE class early in the seat, early in the school year, and I remember the uh, the assistant coach uh, who I knew pretty well, a guy named Max Green. Uh, he he was I walked, he was standing over he was our PE teacher, and he went and got the head coach, a guy named Frank Smith, um, uh, who was a, one of the, the top high school coaches in, in the state of Missouri, and. They were standing over there watching me. I could, I could feel it, you know. So I thought, man, these guys are watching me. This is the head coach watching me. You know? So I <laughs> take my butt off, you know. And they asked me to try out for the team. And so I, so they believed in Max Green and Frank Smith believed in me. And, and then other people have believed in me along the way. Um, Ken Primo at Stratus Boats believed in me and gave me a chance at Stratus when, when I moved to Nashville. And, um, in the, and um, and then when we started um, when we started Phoenix, Teresa and I, I told said to Teresa one day that and I think we started our own boat camp. Well, she believed in me. Greg Strom believed in me. Other people started believing. You know, uh, uh, 
friends and fishermen and dealers and and all the uh, Jeff Hartung and, and Tim Trock, all the people, uh, Tim Trock and Broke and Jeff and Brian and everybody starts believing and pulling the same way. And um, it's nothing I did. I mean, I, I didn't, I can't take, I mean, I, I, I had a, a, a vision, but people believing in you is, is why we're where we're at. I mean, believing and working hard and pulling the same direction. It's an incredible company and it, it is, it's incredible what you guys have accomplished. Um, but outside of believing in you, there's gotta be more to it. Like, is is, is there a, and I will say weirdly enough, when you said that, and I never thought about this before, and I know some people are going to say, I'm just saying this because we work together. Obviously I run a Phoenix boat, but the exact same thing that you just said about believing that's exactly what it feels like to be part of the Phoenix team to be. I mean, I think back and not a lot of people know about this, but you know, last year, or I guess maybe the year previous to that, when um, there was other boat companies that were getting rid of a ton of people, there was a lot of it's going on. So it, it, when that happens, I mean, we tell it like it is. We try to on this podcast, when that happens, people in my line of work, crap their pants really sure. because all of a sudden now there's a bunch of companies pulling back and now there's going to be more people beating on the same door that you beat on and that sort of thing and i still remember you know like we all had a a, a video conference you yeah. know that we all had to get on and i remember i got on and it wasn't and i didn't have my picture up yet because i hadn't turned the and Teresa actually said, Mercer, make sure your picture's on. So we're all on the screen, the entire Phoenix team. And this is days after a bunch of people in the industry got canned. Right. So we are literally all crapping our pants. I, I can, I thought you guys all thought you're going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so we all like are sitting there and you can see everybody. I wish I'd taken a screenshot of everybody's face because everybody's yeah. just like, wow, this is going to be the mass firing of the century. And um you guys started talking about stuff and then Teresa's like, Oh, nobody's uh, what are you guys thinking? Nothing's wrong. Everything's good. Like it was just a practical joke on us really. And, it, but it just made us all feel like, wow, it's so cool to belong and have a company that believes in us. So it's, it, it may have started as that, but I mean, honestly, working with you guys, I can say that's what it feels like to work with Phoenix. Well, and I remember that call and, and that was, I believe that was right after COVID started yeah and, after the, and everybody we were all you know when covid started we were all everybody in the world was scared to death you know yeah we broke and die you know that was that was what what we all we all thought you know and and i i remember that call and that was really just um a, a way to our our goal was to pull everybody together instead of go the other way and my, my i've always tried to go, go the opposite direction of whatever belief is you know, I, I've never been a sheep, I guess. And um, that was really d designed to do just what it did, pull people together and tell people, you know, we may have a rough patch coming, but if we all hang together and believe in each other, we'll make it. And um, fortunately, you know, actually, you know, uh, we're, we're stronger afterwards. But, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, I forgot my train of thought. Now I had some other point there to make, but. That happens to me lots. Don't worry. <laughs> well, what do you think? What do you think? Um, and I got to ask you this because if I don't, I'll get roasted for, but what do you think with everything that's happened in the last few years in the boating world, does the future concern you? You do hear some people in the boating world that are like, man, it, it grew so quick. We're worried that there's going to be a fall off. Where are you at with that? Well, you know, um, we did not, we didn't grow that quick. Really. We, we've grown to, if you look at our numbers, it's been pretty much a steady pace. And, um, I have been criticized some for not growing the company faster. And we had the orders to do it. Um, um there's customers out there going to be shaking. Yeah. I ordered a boat and it took me 14 weeks to get it or whatever, you know, and, We've at the end of every year, we've had orders that we didn't fulfill by a lot. And, um, but, but my, I've always tried, had the philosophy to try, 
to try to grow something slow and steady, have a solid foundation. And, um, you know, the, in, in nature, you know, the, old, the, the weed will grow three foot in three months and the oak tree grows three inches in a year, but the oak tree will be there for a long time and the weed's gone after the season, you know, so I've always tried to grow something slow. But to, to answer your question, um, I think economically there's probably a downturn coming. I think anybody with, with any, uh, you can look at what's going on with gas prices and interest rates and, and where we were at. And I think the economy grew too fast. Um, um, you know, I think the bass boat market itself is a little less uh, affected by a downturn than some other segments of the boating industry. Um, pleasure boats and pontoon boats and those type of things um, usually take a bigger hit faster. Um, Why? It, the bass boat serves, a, it's a need. It's a, yeah. our guys have a passion for it. And, and fortunately for Phoenix, our customer, most of our customers are serious bass fishermen, not just, you know, there's kind of two levels. There's, there's the guy that, that's more of a, of a recreational guy, you know, but our guys are serious. Uh, most of our boats are 250 rated. It's a tournament guy. You know, we're all hardcore. And, and, um, so I, I don't, I'm not overly concerned about Phoenix. Uh, we're in a good spot. We, you know, we're, um, we've been fiscally responsible. You know, we have next to zero debt, so we can weather whatever storm comes along. Um, but, uh, you know, do I think there's some down, uh, 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 economic slowdown coming? I, I do. Um, am I scared of it? No. Um, that answers your question. Yeah. The other question that I have to answer at least once a month um, is I literally, I swear to you, maybe not once a month, but what, at least once a quarter, somebody that I respect in the industry calls me up and says, I heard that Phoenix Boats was sold to Johnny Morris just last night. Um, well, that was a firestorm going on Friday. <laughs> or Thursday and Friday. That, that rumor started somewhere in Texas, and it went on. It circled the world and come back. That happens all the time. We just, we've just we just learned to live with that one. So. Yeah, answer, no, and actually... The answer is no. It, <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you answered it. Uh, but that's actually the last time I heard about it. I heard about it last week, you know, the tail end of the week, where I was like, and I was like, well, my exact answer to the person was like, I do not believe that's true. And I said, but here's why. Not because it may never happen or whatever, because I've already, Gary's told me, like, I have faith it's not going to happen, but there's no way in earth that I have that good a timing because I booked Gary to do an interview next Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's a good point. <laughs> and I swear to you, there was a tiny little part of me like to show behind the scenes. So this morning when we started texting and I'm like, let's do this. What time we want to do this? And you said, give me a quick call. There was a little part of me was like, oh, boy, is this when he's going to be like, just so you know, before. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. You know, it's, it's just I guess if they're not. They're not talking about you. You're not, you're not important, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, there's plenty of people talking about you guys and your product. And, and, um, where's the future for Phoenix? What do you, what, like, do you look at things five, 10 years in advance or how do you generally look at things? Well, I don't know. You know, my, my, my whole career is as uh, you, you talking about five years made me think of this my career has, has kind of been five year segments um you know i had um five years at at stratus customer service five years at stratus sales five years at triton five years at stratus again uh, five years at uh, uh phoenix the first the first five years was in in tullahoma and then the next five years was here in in Winchester and then another five years with the expansion here in, in, in Winchester and it's probably going on more like six now, but, but so it, it's been kind of five year bites. It, it's kind of interesting how that's worked out. It's not been by design. It's just been kind of how it happened. And, um, I, I think the future for us, I think we've built a, we've built a strong brand. Um, and I think we could go some other directions. Um, um, the first obvious, uh, thing that, that we that we're, 
we're considering strongly is, is getting in the walleye market, building a DV boat, um, um, probably probably four different models, two, two common decks, and a, like a serious walleye boat and a, and a 18 or a 22 and a 20, and then a maybe, maybe more of a, a pleasure type boat uh, from the same the deep V hole, kind of the fishing ski perhaps. But, um, and then also aluminum is another another thought. Uh, I would like to do aluminum, and that, that would be a uh, something we know nothing about. So I've got to have I'd have to hire some people that know aluminum. And uh, but I think we've got a brand that would that would uh, would, would do well. And um, so there's a lot of things, and possibly get into some some the bay boat market. But that would be we're thinking about all those things. Um, Some of it might happen, some of it might not. I, I don't know. I really don't. We're we're just looking at it. And what determines that the the market, the demand, or yeah, or the ability to make the right products? Well, you know, you know, when I say we've got a, a brand that we can do a lot of things with, we have a brand that we can do a lot of things with if we do it right. So, you know, we we've got to do these things right. So, um, you know, obviously the 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 getting into the aluminum would be finding somebody that, that, that can do, can do it. You know, you, you like Greg Strom is great with, uh, uh, fiberglass, but well, he, he, he'd be the first to tell you we're, we're not the aluminum people, We've got the brand, <laughs> but we, you know, we need a, we need somebody that knows aluminum and how to build it and what to do with it. I mean, I can, I can run a boat and tell you if it doesn't run right. Yeah. I'm not, like that, and that's how Greg and I have, have worked across the years. You know, I'll, I'll run the boat and hey, Greg, it needs to do this or that. It, when you turn left, it has a little hop in it. You need to take that out. And he can take that. It's almost like a NASCAR crew chief. You know, you, yeah. I come in and say, you know, pushing in the, pushing in turn two or whatever. And, and he, he's taken my, uh, uh, words and, and turned the boat upside down and worked on it and, and make it. Make it You're ready. Cole Trickle and he's Harry Hardy. If you, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. If that's if you don't understand that, you never watch Days yeah. of Thunder. <laughs> um, last question about boats specifically, but where did the name Phoenix come from? Uh, I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. Um, the uh, The, the guy that the, my, the guy that really is really responsible for putting everything together for me um, is, is and the guy uh, Charles Robert Bone in Nashville. Um, he was our he's our attorney. Uh, uh, he believed as well. He's a believer, and um, we 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 started knew we were going to start the company, and we had a we incorporated, and um, we called it Nuco. He called it Nuco, New Company for short. Yeah. And, um, I was researching all kinds of names. I had, uh, looking at Greek gods, you know, and stars in the sky and, uh, had several different names that we had thought about. Um, um, and one day we were, he, he said, uh, in just in comment, he said this, this Phoenix company and it kind of hit, Oh, I like that. Um, and, um, you know, you, you know, that we, we were literally in the ashes. I mean, uh, we had we had left our jobs at Stratus and didn't really have much money. And um, um, you know, the group, the mythical Egyptian bird that rises up out of the ashes. You know, I thought, wow, that's that's us. You know, and um, so I got to give him credit for that. So I, I did not coin that phrase. So, but when he called it a Phoenix company, he didn't mean that as a name. He just meant like this Phoenix company, you guys are rising out of the ashes. That's, 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 what, that's what he meant. And, and, and I've asked him, I said, are you sure you didn't mean that? Are you sure you didn't steal my thunder here? But no, <laughs> but uh, no, he, he didn't mean, he didn't mean it like that, but, um, but it worked, you know, and I was always a car nut and uh, the old, the old Pontiac Firebird. I love that bird, you know, Still a car nut by the by the looks of things. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a car nut, hundred percent. So okay, yeah, here's yeah. what blow. 
That's my that's one of my prized possessions there. I bet. How often do you get a chance to drive it? I hardly ever drive it. It's it's kind of a waste, really. It's a it's a 2019 ZR1 Corvette, and um, 19 was the last year of the front engine Corvettes, the the new Corvettes, the engines and the mid engine and the rear, and that's a, 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 a ZR1, which is the 755 horse. So it's only got 900 miles on it, and the more I drive it, the less it's worth. It's worth a lot more than the sticker price. And uh, so it's kind of a, I drive it a little bit, but it's got its fun to drive. I, I bet. I bet. What I don't understand about you, and I jokingly have said this to you many times, but if I created a boat company, and, and I get it, a lot of people around you made that boat company, I literally would be rolling through town as I, I'm I'm the boat company guy. There would be no part of me that's like, now I want to fish the elite series. How do you how do you compartmentalize all of these different things you do in your life? Like from the outside, I would feel like if I tried to do that many things, it would everything would just be a mess. But how do you like how do you like on tournament weeks? Is it all tournaments or do you find yourself being pulled away and after tournaments, how do you get right back into to Phoenix or is it always just a juggling act? Well, if it wasn't for Teresa Johnson, I would not be fishing. The <laughs> period. I mean, she, she has, uh, um, you know, you know, she, she believed, believed in me early on to do this. And I believe in her now that everything is going to be the same. She, she makes decisions that I make and, and she'll call me if there's something big, but she, she runs the company for the most part. And, um, um, I believe in her. So it's a, it's a two way street, you know? So, um, I'm, I'm able to, to go out there and pretty much just not worry about Phoenix because I know everything's going to be fine. You know? Uh, so that, that's, it's really not, um, people talk about how, you know, how busy I am and all this. Hey, that's not really the case. I mean, that's, <laughs> Phoenix is such a, I've got, we got so many good people that, um, that, that know, and it's been a lot of years trying to, um, create a culture, um, of, of, um, just do the right thing, treat everybody right. And, and the, the people in the organization now at the, at the executive level know pretty much the decision that I would make because of the culture and the, who we are it's not you know I try, um so it, it's it's really not as difficult as everybody thinks it is you know um and, and i'm so thankful to have that if it wasn't for that i could not be doing all, what i'm doing do you feel more pressure competing on the elite series or more pressure going into a, a big i don't know a dealer meeting type thing from a phoenix end facing 100 percent Hundred percent, not more pressure on fishing. This why? This, why? I guess I put it there. I, I feel I feel like that. I, I think I feel like that, and, and I'm, I've kind of mentioned this a little bit on stage. You know, um, my sponsor. You know, everybody has sponsors that walks across the stage, and my sponsors are. I feel like the customers and the dealers. I feel such a such a responsibility. Um, and a pressure, um, to do good for them. Um, it, it, it's, it's, um, and it, it's, it's, it's kind of heavy to be truthful with you, you know, um, because I, 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 uh, without the whole Phoenix is not just a building up here that builds boats. Phoenix is a, is a, a is a dealer network. Of, of great dealers across the country and a, and a, and a, and a customer base of, of great people that believe or, that are passionate. And I get, I get, I get emails and phone calls, um, of somebody thanking me for building a good boat that they bought. And I'm like, man, I should, I'm thanking you, you know, what, why, why are you thanking me? You know, um, it's, it, but it's so, um, it's so humbling that the people are, 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 
are spending their hard-earned dollars and 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 to, to buy something we created and it, it's a pressure that that uh no i mean i put more far more pressure on myself than anybody else ever could and i think it's just you you know like when you pull away from the dock like you said it's at phoenix you're so surrounded by so many people but but when you pull away from the dock it's just you and, yeah. and that, that's that's one of the things that i think makes the elite series and professional fishing as cool as it is. I mean, you look at other anything, you know what I mean? Basketball, baseball, there's you're surrounded by coaches. You're surrounded by people that it, it, you don't carry the entire weight on your shoulders. You know what I mean? You're in a lot of situations. You're not even doing what you might've done. You're doing what a coach tells you to do. But, but in the elite series, yep. once you pull away from that dock and that hoopla stops, it's just you oh, and you. the fish. Oh, you. Um, what's your greatest dream angling wise? What, what drives you? Well, the, the obvious, obvious, obvious goal that I, that I have and, and dream that I have that I have not accomplished is making the Bassmaster Classic, you know, and, um, you know, maybe that'll happen. Maybe it won't, but, uh, um, you know, to, uh, but I, I will say this, that, that, you know, you, you, I, I have said this about other sports that if I was good at basketball or football or baseball or whatever it was, and I, you you see people um, playing past their prime, for example, and, and maybe get criticized, well, they should have quit two years earlier. You know, he ain't what he used to be. He's not as good a pitcher or quarterback or whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> I have said to people, well, I, I, that's that's uh, unjust criticism because if they should I would play as till I got drug off the court or the field and I'll be that way with fishing. I'm gonna play as long as I can show up because I love it. It's a passion. I, I don't I guess if I ever lose that passion I should quit. But um I'm gonna play till so till, till you tell me to leave, Dave. So well I, if it's up to me, I'm never telling you to leave. But um I mean, a prime example of that is is a guy we've already talked about, but Rick Clun. I mean, do you know how many people told me before he won those last two? There was a run there where people were like, Rick, Rick just needs to retire. And Rick, and man, I can't. And I've said this to so many people, and I know they just think I'm saying it, but I'm like, I can't tell you how thankful I am that Rick Clun, because the way everything worked out, like I respected Rick Clun before. But man, in the last whatever three, four years, I respect Rick Clun even more, and it's nothing to do with those victories. It's just watching how Rick Clun evolves with the situation. You know what I mean? At one time, the Elite Series, I don't feel Rick felt it was his job to usher in rookies and stuff, and it wasn't. You know what I mean? But all of a sudden, it became his job. And man, you listen to the rookies talk about Rick Clun, and you. I've just seen times where I walk past a picnic table and there's six different rookies like around him, just listening to every word. And, and it just, to me, that's the way it should be. Like in other sports, you don't ever see that, you know, like if baseball players would love to be able to listen to Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth is still with us in fishing and it's Rick Clun and they get to listen to it. And it's to, to me, it's one of the most amazing things in our sport. It is. I mean, for him to, to accomplish what he's accomplished and still doing what he's doing and, and, and competing at the high level and winning tournaments, you know, I mean, the, the, my first elites, I believe it was the first year that he, that he won Palatka, you know, mm -hmm. of course he was my hero growing up. I had him on my bedroom wall and, and, uh, he, he, he was the, and, and, and he knows it now cause I've shared with him kind of my, my, my background and, and um, he, but he didn't know it at the time. He didn't know me from anybody. And um, actually, he bought a, a farm south of Mansfield where I grew up, about 15 miles. And his, his, his farm borders a creek I used to swim in. But, wow. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but no, to, uh, to, uh, to have made the Elite Series and be able to actually compete with a man that, that I uh, literally idolized growing up um, was uh, 
quite, it was quite special. And to see him win that tournament and then to make the statement, um, never let, never let your, uh, how do you say that? Never uh, believe that your best moments are behind never, you. Never, never, yes. Never believe that your best moments are behind you. And, and I'm trying to tell myself that all the time, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm just 62 years old and he's like, just turned 76. I mean, yeah. Are, amazing you know uh, it, it, it amazes me that it hasn't got more mainstream media like honestly like I, and i don't i know we all love fishing because it's near and dear to our heart but i'm just like there's not this isn't happening in any sport you know nowhere i mean he is still he is this is a weird analogy but he's the elton john of fishing like for five decades he has been making hits and yeah. <laughs> he continues on yeah, I, I think Probably the reason it, it doesn't get any more attention is, is because of Rick's personality himself. He's yeah. a humble man, a quiet man, um, um, and he don't toot his own horn, so to speak. And uh, so, I mean, I think he gets. I think I think he he probably feels like he gets um, credit enough from the people that matter. You know. Yeah. I don't put words in his mouth, obviously. But. No, and and me and him have talked about doing one of these for a long time, and we're going to. Uh, we just have to find the right location because there's only, like one little ledge on his balcony. Yeah. He actually has Zoom. Well, there's, um, there's not much. There's not much down there. I've, I've been there, <laughs> but uh, he's he's such an interesting man to talk to. Every time I talk to him, I, he has a way of of. of looking at things i'll bring something up whatever the case may be and and i walk away going hmm because he looks at you know he looks at different he turns it over and looks at it different than i do and um it, it just it, it always has an interesting interesting perspective on things yeah he uh He's the exact opposite of me. I always joke with him. I'm like, I just keep spitting stuff out. And some of it makes sense. People are like, what you said there made, but they just ignore the paragraph after paragraph of BS. Yeah. Something can, but Rick Klein, you'll have a conversation with him and he says nothing. Then he says three words and you're yeah. just like, yeah, how did those three words outweigh the sentences and sentences just dropped down in front of you? Um, an amazing man. And, uh, Similar to uh, similar to Rick Klun, I think you are an amazing man as well. And you and just like Rick Klun, you're going to say no, no. But I mean, what you've done to support the sport of fishing, what you've done um, to create an industry around Phoenix, and, and what you do on the Elite Series. I mean, it, it's um, it's an honor to call you a friend, Gary Klaus. Well, thank you. I, I'm humbled and embarrassed. <laughs> Can we go for a rip in that car next time I'm down there? Yes, we'll do that. All right. So it's got 900 miles on it now, you said? All right. I, I need to be there when we crack a G. No, or, or it'll go way down if it cracks a G, won't it? Like, what? What? what is the threshold? Where do you need to keep it? Actually, under 1,000. Did that, you ever watch Ferris Bueller? If you put your car in reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that'd be funny. It will top that. We could try, try, try that. We that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it works. I don't. <laughs> I don't think it works, but um, I look forward to seeing you in a few weeks in Oahe. You looking forward to the the Oahe's got? Did you go to Oahe beforehand? By the way, I went last August. Okay, and tell me your take on it. Um, I like it. I, I love the country up there. If you watch the movie uh, Dances with Wolves, that's that's what's what it looks like to me. It's just flat and I've never seen so many sunflowers plants in my life. They got miles and miles of sunflower plants, but it's the Missouri river and, um, small mouth fishing, you know, they're not going to be as big as, as Ontario, obviously, but, but they don't get fish nor much up there, but, but, no, but nobody up there fishes for similar to upstate New York back in yeah. the first time I went there in the eighties, uh, upstate New York, a big small mouth was three and a half, four pounds. And yeah. nobody for him. You know, it was, it was like, uh, well, well, you're going to do what up here? You're going to fish your small mouth. <laughs> it, was, it really was. It wasn't anything like it is today up there as far as the popularity of, of, of the fish and, um, similar, uh, similar in, in, in South Dakota, nobody fish for walleye, but they don't fish for small mouth hardly at all. Yeah. 
basically no no hardly any pressure. It'll be a fun tournament. Um, I'm 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 looking forward to it. I had a really good time up there. It's a real small town, uh, just uh, not I guess uh, probably an hour from the North Dakota border. Yeah, but I mean I I love the place and it's going to be rough I think and it could be it gets pretty rough because it's so flat around here. and uh, and then go straight to uh, lacrosse lacrosse yeah. I'd never been. I went. I went uh, the other day, about right before the off limits. I'd never been to lacrosse. Surprisingly enough, of all the fishing I've done, I'd never been there. Wow, that shocks me. Yeah. What you? What was your take on lacrosse? It, it's pretty fun fishery generally too. Is it? Yeah, a lot of fish. Um, we got three pools to, to to choose from. Seven, eight, and nine. And uh, lacrosse is a pretty cool little town. Um, I had there's interesting. There's a a baseball field right uh, like. It's literally right there where we're going to take off from and maybe way in there. I'm not sure where, where the way in is going to be. I know the, the takeoff is there at that French Creek ramp. Yeah. Have you been there? Uh, yeah. No, I've been there a bunch of times, but I don't know where we're doing way in, but the, I do know the baseball diamond. That's where the lacrosse loggers play. Yeah. Yeah. Great I, I, place. I, I, I was fishing the other day and they're, they're out there. I could play music and the pitchers are warming up and, you know, felt like I was, what was the, what was the minor league uh, baseball? movie uh, field of dreams uh uh no bull durham bull durham okay <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah it, baseball, the field of dreams baseball game is going on next week too by the way at oh the, is it at it's the ha- dreams in iowa yes all right i'll check that out i'll Here's check that out i went to that uh to that place years ago and when i went to iowa to see a boat dealer and I had one day off. I drove out there to the to the field where they filmed the show, and uh, it's pretty cool. That and it was really nothing. And there's like a little old, little old stand, like firework stand that opens up, and the woman come out of the house, the bee house that they wow. Filmed. And she sold me some t-shirts and a cap, you know. And, but now they've got the they've got the field doing major league games there once a year, you know. And yeah. Last, last year, Kevin Costner come walking out of the cornfield, and that yeah. Was that- that, that was cool. cool. Yeah. And it was one of those things that when I heard it was going to happen, I was like, I don't know how, you know, it might be a little cheesy, but it, that, that was one of the coolest things in sports that happened last year, because it literally, it was one of those things that I didn't start watching it, but I had so many friends. Are you watching this? You know, like the, and you, it was, it was awesome. But uh, yeah, we finished up in lacrosse. All I know about lacrosse is it has more bars per capita than any other city in uh in the united states and um bars i saw them yeah there's a bunch of them they like to have a good time it uh and here's here's one last story the weirdest sometimes we forget our little gig that we do is weird you know and and it was in lacrosse wisconsin where you launch there you actually drive over the an overpass that runs over the over the river so as you Generally, when launch is happening, if you're a little later, you're in a lineup to turn in there. So it was one morning and I'm sitting there and I'm in a lineup and I'm beside like a hydro truck, you know, like a big truck. There's six to eight guys sitting in this truck, you know, drinking their coffee and they're looking over and they are like pointing and laughing at our sport. And I'm like, what? how could these people be? And then I just looked at it from other people's eyes. I'm like, you know, you go to baseball, you go to hockey, you go to football, you go to whatever you want. If any of them showed up at 5.30 in the morning and cranked music, you'd be like, what is wrong with these idiots? But the most peaceful sport on earth, fishing, that's what we do. <laughs> so I'm glad we do it, though. I don't know what else I would do. Me and you both. I'm thankful that you did this, Gary Klaus. We will see you in a few weeks. And uh, thanks for sharing some time with me. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Gary Klaus, an amazing man that has accomplished some amazing things and has some amazing stories. Um, But I think the thing that stands out is one word, believe. It is amazing what people can accomplish when somebody believes in them. And, And that, like Gary said, it goes back to my mom believing in me and, and that you know, doesn't seem like it should stand out. Your mom believes in you, but there's a lot of people out there that their mom doesn't believe in them. So show faith and show belief in a person. That person can accomplish incredible, incredible things. So um, I'm glad people believed in Gary Klaus. And uh, 
I'm glad he believed enough in me to uh, come on this show. And uh, I'm glad you guys believed enough in us to watch this show. And um, here's a guy who I will never stop believing in. To end our show, take it away, Bob Cobb. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?